All right, so for folks just joining us, we're gonna get started here in just a minute or so. Uh, we're allowing folks to join us. Um, we'll get started exactly at 7.10. And we are planning to be done by 8.30. I know we're getting some questions about how long we'll be on here. So we're planning to be done at 8.30. All right, guys, so I think we're pretty close to 710. We'll just get started. The register or attendees are coming in pretty slowly at this point. So welcome, everybody. Thank you so much for being here. Uh, we are, really appreciate your time. Um, you are at the UC admission point, so you are going to hear from a few um, UC campuses tonight. And my name is Violeta Gorgonio. I'm one of the assistant directors for the Office of Undergraduate Admissions at UC Berkeley. And then I'll, I'll allow the rest of my colleagues to go ahead and introduce Okay, um, I can start off, I guess. Uh, my name is Cynthia. I'm with UC San Diego, one of the admission officers, and we'll be able to kind of chat and answer all of your questions today. So feel free to use the Q&A box. Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Sebastian Franco. I am the admissions counselor for UC Santa Barbara. Um, same thing as well, Cynthia. If you have any questions, again, add them on the uh, Q&A. I'll be glad to answer any questions about UCSB as well. Hi everyone, my name is Judy Nguyen. Uh, I'm a senior evaluator in the Office of Admissions at UC Santa Cruz. Um, same thing goes, if you have any questions, I'm keeping an eye, an eye on the Q&A um, for Santa Cruz specific questions. And thanks for having me, thanks for attending. Hello everyone, my name is Tim Ford. I serve as the Northern California Bay Area Admissions Advisor for UC Merced. And diddle to what was said before. If you have any questions about UC Merced, I'll be uh, eyeing the Q&A. Hey everyone, good evening. My name is Melanie David with UC Davis Undergraduate Admissions. I am the Bay Area Regional Representative. Happy to be here. Great. I think we got everybody, right? Perfect. All right, so we're going to go ahead and get started. And in terms of the recording, we are going to record it. Actually, let me go ahead and make sure we are recording. I paused it. Nope. All right, so it looks like we're good. All right, guys, so um, we are going to go ahead and get started. Thank you so much for your patience. And again, thank you so much for being here. We will um, share the recording via email as soon as we're able to in the next week or so. So just be patient with us. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and just get started here briefly with who we are. Um, as you can see from this screen here, there is a, camp, a map of the different campuses. So we are actually one of the largest university systems in the world. The University of California is really proud of that. Um, we offer uh, an abundance of undergraduate and graduate programs in, camp on, in all of our different campuses located across the state. Um, you'll see you have a selection from a handful of states in Northern California to another handful of states down in Southern California. And really, we always tell folks to think about location when you're thinking about where you're applying, right? Because if you're interested in kind of being by the beach, you only have a few options, right? But if you're thinking about being more inland, or maybe you're thinking about being close to Hollywood, or maybe you're thinking that you want to be near the Silicon Valley, right? You have a couple of options. So really think about location. Think about the size of the campus. If you see yourself in a large university, then you might wanna look into kind of the size of the different campuses. Now we're gonna go over a quick kind of timeline and information about the actual fees. Um, the UC application is available on August 1st. So it's available now for any of our seniors who are 
actually in the process of applying, you're able to submit or you're able to start filling it out now, but students cannot submit until November 1st. So November 1st is actually this weekend, guys. So if you're ready to submit your application on Sunday, you will be able to press submit if you want to. There is just one application for all nine undergraduate campuses, uh, but there is a fee for per campus. It's $70 for US citizens and permanent residents. And it will be $80 for any students who are international students. Oops, sorry, moved ahead a little quickly there. Um, so there are the fees. And then of course, we also have application fee waivers for students who might need those. We uh, provide up to four fee waivers for four different campuses, and it is available through the application. So you actually have to go into the application, fill it out, put in your information, your family's income, your family size, and then at the end of the application, it'll tell you if you're eligible for the actual fee, fee waiver. So keep that in mind. And the fee, fee waiver is available for you know any US citizen, permanent um, resident, immigrant, or any student who's um, eligible for AB 540 benefits. And just keep in mind, it's only up to the four campuses. So you would have to pay for any extra campuses if you wanted to apply to more. Um, and then the UC system also, we also accept the NACAC fee waiver. So you can actually get those from your counselors. So just know that you can also do that from your high school counselors. And then applications are not necessarily reviewed in the order that they're submitted. So keep in mind, if you submit November 1st, it really doesn't make a difference if like if you submit November 1st or if you submit November 30th. So as long as you get it in by the deadline, that's the main thing. Um, we don't have early action. We don't have early decision. So everybody applies at the same time. And essentially everybody gets notified of admission around the same time, which is usually March or April, um, depending on if you're applying as freshman or as a transfer. All right, so choosing a campus. As students consider kind of which campuses they're hoping to apply for, I already talked about some of the things that you should think about, right? The, the location, the size of the campus, where it's located, but also think about the majors that are offered. Not every UC has the same majors, although we do share a lot of common majors. We, we might all have like a some sort of a, a form of political science or psychology or history. Um, but we don't all have identical majors. So we definitely encourage students to apply broadly. Really, no matter you know which one of our campuses you're thinking about going to, there's you're still going to earn a prestigious degree from the UC system. So keep in mind that that is going to be, um, you know, regardless of where you go, it's still going to be an amazing degree from the University of California. And again, there's going to be different majors at different campuses. So kind of think and look and see what's the best one for, for you. We encourage really students to think about these different questions. So which campus offers your major of choice? What are the differences between the names of the majors and departments um, at the different UCs? Kind of what, you know, is there a specific difference within these particular majors? There might be, you know, one, might, one department might offer something a little bit different in terms of the major and kind of what does that major mean for you, right? What does it mean for you as a student when you're actually applying? Is it gonna be the right fit for you? So definitely look at the courses that are offered in that particular department and make sure that it sounds like the right fit. Um, we also have campuses across the state, as I mentioned earlier. So just know that there's different settings um, and they offer really different opportunities for students educationally and professionally for you to explore and kind of discover things. Um, but you know, the UC does offer a range of, of opportunities for students needs to be met for their um, expectations in their college environment. So just know that there's gonna be a lot of resources for you to be able to take advantage of in terms of academic support or being able to explore kind of your needs or explore your interests in general. And then I mentioned earlier, campus size is important. We really want students to feel that they're, they're thinking about that, that you're at the right type of institution. If it's a large campus or a small campus, definitely think about all of those things. And I, like I mentioned, right, you wanna explore to see kind of the size of the different campuses. And then just for a little bit of a tidbit of info, campuses with students that have 30,000 students or more undergraduate, that would be Berkeley, Davis, Irvine, UCLA, and then UC San Diego. And then campuses between 20,000 and 29 undergrad, 29,000 undergraduate students, that's Riverside and Santa Barbara. Campuses between 15 and 19,000 students, that would be Santa Cruz. 
And then our smallest campus is Merced with 10,000 students. All right. So as a public institution, Berkeley undergraduate students are, you know, overwhelmingly California residents. So definitely keep that in mind that the majority of our students are from the state of California. Of course, we have students from all over the world and all over the United States, but California is definitely our priority um, to be able to serve those particular students. Almost half are also first generation and a third of, of our population is also transfer. So we actually admit a, a lot of our transfer students come from the California Community College system. In fall 2019, 28% of our newly enrolled transfers were from the California Community College system. So it's just a tidbit of info there. And I'm gonna actually pass it over to my colleague, Melanie, who will continue on with the next slide. Yeah, great. So now we're gonna talk a little bit about our academic engagement in the UC system. So just some uh, statistics about students being involved on our campus. So how many students participate in community service? Almost half of our students do. Um, more than half of our students participate in an internship uh, field work. So these are just ways where students are networking. Uh, they're meeting people, they're getting experience, whether they like it or not. <laughs> I always say every experience is great experience because it helps narrow down what students like, what they don't like, maybe um, they meet someone in that experience. And 85% of our students conduct research or some sort of project with our faculty. So there's a lot of access within all of our UC campuses where students can get involved. Um, they network, being just part of the UC system, They again, are able to participate in different areas. Um, they can try out new things and who knows, they might even work for undergraduate admissions one day <laughs> when um, and answer any of the questions that we have. So one of the ways, again, that we want students to participate on our campus to get involved, to make a difference in their community, on their campus, but also in this world. And next. We also want to stress and let students know that we support all students on our campuses. We support our undocumented students, our AB 540. We have foster youth, former foster youth on our campuses. We have veterans. We have depend students with dependents, um, underrepresented students, first generation. So there's a lot of centers that all of us have on our campuses. Um, that's a really great way for students to connect with people that they identify with. Maybe it's culturally, ethnically, um, maybe again, it's veterans, maybe it's re-entry students, uh, transfer students. So again, there's a lot of ways that we support our students once they are on our campus. I know we're in the virtual world right now, but our students are still getting supported where they need. And next. Which leads me to, again, the support for our students. We really want to make sure that they are staying healthy mentally, emotionally, and physically. Um, we know 2020 is such a trying time for everyone. I know our worlds have been turned upside down. I still feel like I'm in a time warp of it's March, but here we are, it's almost November. So we really take care of our students. We really want to make sure again that they are mentally healthy. And if they're not, we have services for them on our campuses um, or how are they emotionally? How are they physically? Because all of these three things factor into how they are going to succeed on our campuses. If they are not healthy, they are not going to pass the classes. Um, they are not going to connect with the community. So we really take part in that. And again, being in this virtual world, all of our campuses are still reaching out to our students. We still have these services where students can talk to someone about their mental state right now, whether they're stressing out, maybe there's a lot of um, uncertainty, which we're all dealing with. So again, our students are supported in that way on our campuses. And next. So now we're gonna dive into, I'm sure a lot of questions are going about the freshman admission requirements. Um, so the first step uh, on the next slide is our freshman admission requirements as a UC system as a whole. So I know all of you are used to seeing three rings that the UCs are really looking at. This year, we have changed a bit. I know, again, 2020 has been a year of change. <laughs> um, so we are looking at your A through G requirements. I know a lot of your counselors um, do a really great job of letting you know what those A through G courses are. Um, if they're like your math, your science, your history, so on and so forth. 
and then your GPA. The minimum GPA is a 3.0, but you all know the UC system is very competitive. So keeping the GPA as best as you can is the best that you can do, right? We know, again, times are a little bit different right now. Um, the GPA that we are looking at is your 10th and 11th grade. If you took summer courses after ninth grade, that will be factored into your GPA. If you took summer courses after 11th grade, so this, summer, this past summer for you seniors, that will be factored into your GPA as well. Um, so seniors, your GPA is what it is, but that's okay. Again, you are more than just a number. There's other places in your application, which we'll talk about where you can talk about yourself. Um, but these are the freshener requirements as of right now. So I'm going to pass it along to Mr. Timothy um, to go into a little bit more detail about our freshman admission. Thank you, Melanie. So admission to the UC system is technically a two-step process. And as Melanie just uh, mentioned, uh, the first step is eligibility. Um, eligibility, of course, is defined by all the key elements she mentioned in terms of meeting your A through G requirements and the minimum GPA um, uh, for residents as well as non-residents. The second portion is considered selection. Selection is basically how each of the UC campuses will admit those students who have been deemed eligible. Now do keep in mind that the applicant pool for each campus is different and the selection of students is delegated very differently. So the way in which campuses select students is gonna also vary. So it's important as mentioned earlier that you do apply broadly. We all utilize a multiple number of factors um, in our consideration for selection. And you're always considered um, in the context of your own environment, whether it's in where you're living, your family, as well as the applicant pool of the schools that you're applying to specifically. Um, so it is to your advantage when applying to the UC that you provide as much information as possible on the application. Do not leave anything off. Anything that you feel is important to share with us, we want you to share it. If you don't share it, that is considered a missed opportunity. And then also keep in mind that each campus will select students independently. So what we're gonna happen in terms of selection, we're not going to be contacting each individual campus, my sister campuses and finding out if they've admitted a particular applicant. So San Diego, for example, will not call Merced. I will not be calling Berkeley to find out where a particular student is in their selection process. We all review and select students independently of one another. Next slide, please. Thank you. <laughs> so in general, campuses are looking for well-qualified students who have taken advantage of all the educational opportunities that are provided at their schools, uh, both inside as well as outside the classroom. Uh, we all utilize a process known as comprehensive review. So we're not just looking at you um, from a number, like just your GPA, but there's a number of other factors that are taken into account. So all campuses will use a form of comprehensive review. However, comprehensive review may be called something differently at each UC campus. Some campuses utilize what is called holistic review. Some campuses may utilize a hybrid of, of comprehensive and holistic, but in true essence, it's all considered comprehensive review. So we're gonna be looking at a number of factors in determining how we're gonna select our students. So to kind of give you an idea, there are usually about 14 to 15 factors that are all utilized by the campuses. So looking at your GPA, we're taking into account the rigor of the courses that you've completed as well as those that you have planned for your senior year. We're taking into a context um, academic opportunities that are available at your school. And are you taking advantage of those opportunities? Special achievements you have received, special awards, maybe you possess certain leadership skills. Perhaps you were team captain of the school basketball team or certain leadership role in one of the student in one of the school's organizations. Or maybe at home, you're taking care of a younger sibling through tutoring, for example. We want to know about all those elements, positive grade trends. Perhaps your sophomore year was meh, but you turned it around during your junior year and you've seen its upward incline. We're taking into account your involvement in educational prep programs, such as AVID classes, uh, programs like Gear Up and UC Upward Bound. So again, all these elements are gonna be utilized in the comprehensive review process. Also keep in mind that some schools um, in the system are still using test um, SAT for as, for as far as test optional, but that means optional is what it means. You will not be penalized 
if you do not take those examinations. And some campuses may use those scores that have been reported for their comprehensive review. So it is important that you reach out to each individual campus to find out what their practices are in light of this recent change. We're also looking at your achievements within the educational environment and the resources that's available to you. Next slide, please. So as was mentioned, there's been a lot of policy changes in light of COVID-19. One is being the temporary suspension of the letter grade requirements for A through G courses completed in winter, spring, and summer of 2020. So if your school uh, graded you on a pass, no pass, or credit, no credit basis, we will continue to honor those passing marks um, to meet A through G requirements. Um, next, next slide, please. Now, we, as I mentioned, we will continue to utilize those scores. However, we will not, oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> However, we will not be accepting letter grades of D or F to meet A through G requirements. And also within our comprehensive review process, we will be taking into account those schools that have been grading students on the pass credit or no credit basis. So basically just to make sure that we're not gonna be comparing these students with students from other schools that may not have been award, uh, grading accordingly. So it's all within the context of your own individual school. But again, we're not lowering our standards. We basically, we're just moving forward to uh, allow for students the ability um, to utilize these passing marks to make sure that they are meeting their A2G requirements. Now, I do wanna also point out that if you are receiving passing grades or what have you, you still need to meet the minimum eligibility requirements uh, for the 3.0 for California residents, 3.4 for non-residents. So we will not be taking into account those courses that are marked as passed in terms of the GPA calculation. So do keep that in mind. But again, we will be using those marks to satisfy any A through G course requirement. Next slide, please. And with that, I'd like to turn it over to my colleague from Santa Barbara, Mr. Sebastian, to go over transfer admission. Thanks, Tim. All right, so going into the transferring process. Um, so again, even if you're a freshman, this may be applying to you um, as you're thinking about going to either a community college or an our university. Um, so kind of a couple of things that we as a UC system consider when we're talking about transferring. So one thing is that we as a UC policy have that every two undergraduate students, we wanna have one transfer student. So again, we try to have a pretty good high ratio of undergraduate students to um, um, transfer students as well. So keep that in mind. Now within as well, the California Community Colleges, if you're transferring from any of those California Community Colleges, the UC system will actually give priority to those students over any other student who is transferring from any other institution. That may include as well another UC. So you do not have a better chance of transferring from another UC campus over a California Community College. So again, something to keep in mind this, you actually might be better off going to California Community College if you're really considering transferring in that route. Now, of course, some tools that we do have as well available for all the students, including our current students, to help them in the process of going into a UC campus um, transferring over. It's going to be the Transfer Admissions Planner, also known as TAP, um, and also the Transfer Pathways, which I'll talk a little bit more in just a second. But these are two different tools. And again, also the TAG program, which I'll talk about in a couple of slides with more detail. But they're all different tools that all of you are welcome to use at the moment. If you just put in any search engine, UC TAP or UC Transfer Pathways, you will receive a lot more information about it just in case you're looking into that. But going to the next slide. So the minimum requirements for any transfer students. Um, so one thing to keep in mind is that when I'm talking about transfer students, this means that a student has to have graduated from a high school and attend another institution, regardless if it's a community college or another university. I only state this because you may already have some credits from high school because you were doing dual enrollment. So again, still to be considered transfer students, you have to have graduated from high school and attend an art institution. So the minimum requirements going off that is a seven course pattern, which basically is the same concept as the A through G courses. Um, so again, you basically have to meet specific courses within a community college or another university to transfer over. And again, we have the whole list online for more details. And then of course, you do need to have at least 60 semester or 90 quarter units um, that are transferable to the UC system. So again, this is what I was going back. If I have any high school students who are considering transferring, something to keep in mind is that those college credits may count or dual enrollment courses may count towards this 60, 90 quarter limit or minimum. But again, you need to have graduated. And of course the minimum GPA, if you are in California, is a 2.4 and the minimum for out of state students is gonna be a 2.8. However, as you heard before as well for Melanie, it does, that's the minimum, but of course, we're always looking for higher and above if possible. Next slide, please. 
and then um, requirements and selection. So again, similar to the freshman application, not only do we look at the requirements, the ones that we just talked about, but we are also looking at the specific major that you're applying to within each of the UC campuses. So part of the selection process is going to be really important and critical that you double check which major you're applying to. And again, it may be multiple uh, majors across the different campuses. But based on the major that you choose, we are going to be asking for different things. So it's really important that you do check on which major you're applying to and what are those requirements for those specific majors. And the next slide. Um, so then transfer pathways, as we mentioned before, is one of the easiest tools that we could um, that students can actually use when they're considering transferring into a UC campus. What transfer pathways does is that if a student is thinking about multiple majors across UC campuses or potentially the same major, let's just say biology, these are just some of the examples, not limited to this, um, but let's say biology at five different UC campuses, transfer pathways will actually support you in the process of ensuring that you take the courses that you need at that either community college or other university to then be eligible to transfer into that UC campus. So again, it is a very supportive um, tool, but it is important that you do check out on it. Of course, we always recommend communicate with each of the admissions offices just to make sure you're actually following through with all of it. So if you have any questions, you can always contact us. And the next slide over, we'll talk a little bit more about the TAG. So Transfer Admissions Guarantee Program. I always love talking about this one just because it is probably one of the easiest ways to transfer into a UC campus, as long as, of course, you meet certain criteria. So again, how does it work? So six of the nine UC campuses will have this. You can see them all on the map, or sorry, in the map on the actual screen. But basically Berkeley, LA, and San Diego are the only three UC campuses that do not have the TAG program. However, for the other six, they do. And again, what happens is that you need to attend a California Community College, doesn't matter which one, but it has to be a California Community College to be eligible for this program. And then of course, you have to have a 3.4 minimum GPA and of course, pass specific courses for your specific major at the UC campus. Another thing to keep in mind is that if you're considering the TAG program, double check with each of the UC campuses, which majors are under the TAG program because not every single major will be part of the TAG program. So just to give an example, at UCSB, every major in the College of Letters and Science except music and dance are at the TAG program, but engineering, music, dance, and majors in the College of Creative Studies are not part of the TAG program, even though us as a campus are part of it. So again, double check as you go into each of them. But with that, I will actually pass it on to Judy to finish off the transfer portion. Thank you. Um, okay, so regarding uh, transfer eligibility requirements, because this last year has been very difficult and unusual, um, there have been some temporary modifications uh, due to the COVID-19 situation. So usually um, of the 60 semester units or 90, if you're coming from uh, Foothill or De Anza or Lake Tahoe, which uses the quarter system, um, of the 60 units required to, trans to transfer to a UC, usually 46 of those units have to be taken with a letter grade. Um, but because of COVID, uh, many schools ended up changing their systems to pass, no pass or credit, no credit, or there were just issues with uh, students and professors getting um, acclimated to using a virtual online learning tool. So for any courses that were taken between or during winter, spring, or summer 2020 that were passed no pass or credit, no credit, it's not gonna to count towards the capped amount of um, pass, no pass courses that you're usually allowed to take. Um, so therefore, usually a student can have 14 of their 60 semester units as pass, no pass. Um, but once again, if you had taken any courses during winter, spring or summer 2020 as pass, no pass or credit, no credit, you can have those 14 semester units plus whatever was taken during those three terms as pass, no pass. Um, whoops. And so we covered why, um, why this policy is, is temporarily suspended. So it's just because of just the difficulties, we didn't wanna add any more barriers to our transfer students. So, um, okay. Next slide, please. Thank you. Um, okay, so all campuses, all the UC campuses 
are accepting um, pass no pass grades, um, but you'll also have to look take a look at major prep for certain majors um, require major prep courses in order to transfer on top of the eligibility requirements. So um, in the UC system, all, all of the majors actually will be accepting pass no pass uh, grades, except for a couple of majors at UC Santa Cruz, um, the psychology department and cognitive science majors um, actually will not be accepting pass no pass or credit no credit grades for a few of their major prep courses, such as statistics, which requires a, a minimum of a B minus or higher. Um, and since if the pass no pass or credit no credit grade is equivalent to a C, which is a 2.0 or better, the UC will allow it to, uh, will allow it to be used for the UCE and UCM requirements, which is part of the seven course pattern. Um, however, the articulation of the courses, the transferable courses um, will still be, um, they'll still be, it will still depend on each of the individual major departments. So, okay, next slide. All right. So I'm going to talk just a little bit about uh, cost of attendance and financial aid. I am not a financial aid officer, I'm an admissions officer, so um, I'm not going to go into heavy detail about this, um, but I did want to cover it because it's very important to, to students in general. So this graph here, um, thanks, sorry, I didn't, <laughs> I forgot to tell you next slide, B. <laughs> Um, so this graph here pretty much talks a little bit about retention rates for the UC system. So we have really good retention rates here. And you might wonder why, you know, if I'm talking about financial aid, why am I talk, showing you a, a graph on retention rates? And the reason is that if you're more likely to graduate in four years, uh, if coming in as a freshman or two years coming in as a transfer student, you will be saving money because you won't be spending more time spending more money and more classes in order to graduate. So the sooner you graduate, the less money you'll be spending at, at college. Um, so 92% of both freshmen and transfer students come back the next year. So we do a really good job of retaining our, our students that very first year. Um, and then more than half of our students graduate uh, within four years for freshmen or within two years for transfer students. And even if they go over, 84% of our freshmen still graduate within six years and 88% of our transfers graduate uh, within four years of enrolling at the UC. And um, once you're admitted to the UC, our main goal is as advisors is to work to really hard to help you um, graduate in a timely manner because it's not just important to you and saving you money it's important to us too because we want you to be successful um, so for those students to actually go over the four years and two years there there are good reasons for why students spend a little bit longer in school um, 11 percent of uc students actually do double majors so that's you know, they're doing twice the work and still finishing in a really good amount of time. And more than 5,000 of our students actually do the study abroad program, which does take a little bit of extra time, but it's definitely worth it for the experience. Okay. Next slide. Sorry, next slide B. Thank you. Okay. That's so, me. Sorry, is, is this one you? Oh, this is you, Judy. I'll do the next one. Okay, thank you. Okay. Are you sure you don't want to do this one? <laughs> okay. Um, so this graph, it's it kind of, um, it just puts the cost of college into perspective for you. So we wanted to compare the cost of, for, of a college degree to the cost of, of, you know, a base model compact car. So in this example, we use the cost of a 2020 Honda Civic. And um, we use, and the numbers come from the Edmunds.com website, if you're wondering. And we compare the investment of a new car to a UC degree. So the amount of money borrowed is similar between the car, 21,872, uh, 21, a UC education, which is 21,000. But 
it definitely like the, the rate of interest definitely it's eye-opening as time goes on. So the cost to own a car to you, it rises every year that you have that car. So you have to do maintenance, you have to pay insurance, you have to pay gas, you have to um, pay the interest rates for the loan. Whereas the UC uh, education, while you're still in school, there are no interest rates. You don't have to pay any maintenance fees for your education. Um, it's all part of the tuition payment. So, or tuition and fees. So it stays the same. And then after five years, you can see the cost of the car really starts ballooning. You've paid $48,000 to have this car. Whereas after five years, you're, you still only paid $13,000 for that degree. And it even it's even more eye-opening if you look at the very last number there. So after five years, you have actually spent spent $35,000 on that car. Whereas after five years with your degree, it will have made you back on average that, um, that amount of money there. So a degree is infinitely a better um, investment for yourself and your future than just a car. Thanks, and I'm passing it on. <laughs> okay, I'll take it from here, Judy, thank you. Um, again, friends, I am also not a financial aid advisor, but I did wanna share some additional information with you. Um, what you see on our screen here is the financial aid philosophy of the UC. Uh, we approach the financial aid process as a partnership between our parents, families, um, the student, and the UC. Uh, the parents will contribute based on their financial resources, and we know that we know what their financial resources are based on the, based on the information um, that is provided on the FAFSA or the California Dream Act. The students will contribute based by working and borrowing money. And the UC will, uh, will coordinate federal, state, and UC resources to provide the student with their financial aid eligibility. Um, and this chart right here shows uh, the factors that are considered in the cost of attendance. So please keep in mind that these are average costs across the UC. So every individual campus cost will vary depending on that uh, campus, right? Um, so the type of room and board students choose will impact the cost. You know, for example, if you select a single room uh, versus a double room or a triple room, um, it will impact how much you are paying for that room and board. If students do not bring a car, the transportation costs might be lower, right? Um, if the books and supplies will vary depending on the major and the types of text required. You know, there could be classes that, you know, require textbooks that are accessed online or, you know, like a lot of our campuses also offer resource centers that oftentimes have libraries where our students donate textbooks. Um, so it's really important that you kind of reach out to these resources first and it could definitely lower the cost. Um, and if students are covered by family health insurance, um, then that means you won't necessarily have to purchase, you know, a particular UC insurance coverage. So that could also uh, lower the cost in the long run. Um, okay, on this slide, we do have some significant numbers that are important for you to remember. Um, the UC philosophy that we just mentioned yields a big result for California students, okay? 57% of California students pay $0 in system-wide tuition and fees due to the financial aid that they receive. Uh, nearly three of four California students, or 72% um, of students receive grants and scholarships to help reduce their costs. So the average award is about $17,000 um, or $3,000 more than the cost of tuition and fees. Um, and 42% of California students graduate with no student loan debt, which is huge. Okay, um, so this clearly indicates, you know, that students graduate from, a, uh, from the UC on average with almost $10,000 less uh, debt compared to the national average. So if you see on our screen here, the national average is about $30,100 um, and the UC average is $21,018. Um, so it's definitely a significant um, reduction in the long run. 
And lastly, friends, I just wanna you know, quickly remind you to apply early. Um, the free application for federal student aid, more commonly known as the FAFSA, opens up every year on October 1st, and you can submit it anytime through March 2nd. Um, you would start working on this senior year, of course, and it's really, really important that you prioritize this application. If you have not started it, I really, really recommend that you start as of yesterday, okay? Uh, you really need to prioritize this application and it's important for you to be in charge of your own process. So it's important that you know the financial aid timelines, the deadlines, the lingo, um, and of course the communication practices. And if you do have any questions, um, always reach out to the financial aid offices uh, for the campuses you're interested in. They can provide a lot more insight um, and it's also important for you to apply for scholarships, right? It's never too early to start working on um, scholarship applications. So even though, you know, you're working on your financial aid application senior year, you could be a freshman or a sophomore or a junior, um, and you can start applying for those scholarships. Uh, so we really recommend that you spend time each week submitting those applications. Okay, friends, I think I will pass it back to Sebastian and he'll take it from here. Perfect. Thanks, Cynthia. Um, yeah, so just to wrap up the presentation, the main overall presentation before we move on to our specific campuses, just to give you a quick three minute overview of each of our campuses. Um, we want to share some additional resources for you all. Um, so again, if you do care to take a picture of it, please do so as well. Um, we do have all the resources online. So don't worry if you don't have a chance to write it down or if you just think it's too long of a link. Uh, but again, for any general admissions about the whole UC system, not just uh, specific campus, please do look into just the University of California.edu backslash admissions. Um, basically a cheat code or a cheat way to actually look into this. If you actually just put UC general admissions information or something along those lines in any search engine, it will show up there for you for the first uh, thing that will show up actually on the um, search engine. So again, definitely just look into that. Uh, same thing goes for any of our selection process. So if you're looking for specifics, I know we got a lot of questions about the SAT and ACTs which means complete sense as well. Uh, please go into this page. It will actually list down which QC campuses or how it's gonna look like for our selection process. We uh, will also talk about our SATs and ACTs in just a second for our campuses. So again, that way you have a better idea. Again, we know there's a lot of questions about that. Um, and then the UC admissions selection process for transfer. So same thing as the freshman, if there's any question about transfers, we will have more information on that. And on the next screen over, we'll have the last few resources. Again, same as the last one, just giving you additional resources. So the first one is the personal insight questions. So again, even if you're not a senior, you're welcome to look at them ahead of time just to have an idea of what they look like. Uh, but again, eight questions, you answer four of those. Um, and then application procedures. So again, how do you do the application? This is both for freshmen and transfer students. And the last two resources, as we mentioned before, are gonna be transfer specific. So you see transfer pathways we already talked about. Assist.org is probably gonna be one of the best tools you can have as that one actually works with all the California community colleges and every UC campus as well. So again, if you wanna see if any class or course will be articulated or transferred into UC campus, this will be the best way to go about it as well. But with that, we will move on to actually going on to each of our campuses. And I believe B actually starts it off. You're muted B, sorry. Thank you. Thank you so much. So easy to make that mistake. So um, I'm going to go ahead and get started with Berkeley. Um, I know you all kind of already saw a map of where we're located, but just to remind folks, especially our Southern California folks, uh, Berkeley is located in the San Francisco Bay Area. We are near the Silicon Valley, near the city of Oakland and the city of San Francisco. Uh, we have approximately about 43,000 total overall students on our campus. Uh, with 184 academic departments for our undergraduate students to select from and about 13,000 different courses for students to be able to take as well. As you can see from our screen, we do have a faculty uh, student to faculty ratio of 18 to one. So our faculty are definitely accessible to our students who are seeking out our faculty members for maybe letters of recommendation or maybe for research opportunities. Uh, we also have nine current faculty members who are on staff who have won Nobel, Nobel Prizes. So if you're interested in taking a class with a Nobel Prize winner, you have that opportunity to do so. Um, our students are studying abroad in a hundred different plus countries all over the world. And this is a UC 
wide program. So keep in mind that no matter which UC campus you go to, you can study abroad through our EAOP program. Uh, Berkeley does have a couple of unique options where our students are able to go abroad to London in their first semester as freshmen. Um, so your first fall term could actually be in London if you wanted to opt for that program. We also have some really cool dual degree programs abroad through university in France and a university in Hong Kong. So that would be an option if you're interested in applying to Berkeley, you would go there for the first two, three years, depending on the campus, and then you would come to Berkeley for two more. Berkeley students also have an awesome, the awesome opportunity to create and instruct their own college classes. So we have what's called decals here on the Berkeley campus and our students are actually developing the curriculum for these classes on their own and then they're actually teaching them. Of course, they're getting assistance from a faculty and um, an advisor who's helping them kind of construct these. But just to give you all an idea of some of the classes that were offered this fall, students were able to take a class on UC Hogwarts, the Wizarding World of Harry Potter, Cal Pokemon Academy, Knitting 101, and then Life Skills Intro to Baking. So just a couple of units that you can take on the side that actually count towards graduation and you can you know, build community through these different opportunities. We also have over 1200 clubs and organizations for students to get involved and to kind of figure out what you know they're interested in and find their passion. Some of these range from affinity clubs to pre-professional to religious, political, of course, Greek life and various sports and opportunities. Berkeley also, is also a D1, um, Division I um, NCAA school. So any of our students who are interested in participating in athletics at that college level, we do have that opportunity for you. We have folks who have gone to the Olympics, um, who won Olympic medals. Uh, we've you know, sent folks on to like NBA and NFL teams like uh, Marshawn Lynch or Aaron Rodgers. Um, and then also just to move on, just to touch base a little bit on housing. Housing is prioritized for first year students, specifically freshmen and first year transfers. And we do have a variety of opportunities for students, traditional dorms, as well as themed floors. Um, like our women in STEM or our African-American floor or our Chicano, uh, Ch Chicanx Latinx floor. And then lastly, I just wanted to mention our SAT situation at Berkeley. We are going test free, so we're not going to be considering um, SAT or ACT at all um, in our process, but we'll still accept um, optional exams like SAT subject exams and ACT or AP exams or IB exams. So that is something we're still considering, although it is optional. So we're going to hand it over to Davis now. Great. Thank you, Violetta. So hi, everyone. It's Melanie from UC Davis again. So I like to say uh, we are, especially if you're in the Bay Area, um, I know some of you are really close to UC Berkeley, um, but UC Davis is there too. We are about 30 minutes away from Sacramento. We are the northernmost UC. We also have a Tahoe Environmental Research Center, as well as our Bodega Bay Marine Biology Laboratory. So students have access to do internships there during the summer. We actually have a residential program in Bodega Bay Marine Biology Lab, so students can take classes there, as well as do research alongside our faculty members. Uh, we do have a 20 to one student faculty ratio. Um, I think part of the UC application, however, I think all of us can attest to this, is that yes, you might be in one of those huge lecture halls. Sorry, parents, I know that's not what you wanna hear, but if you're looking for a UC, uh, UC experience, being in one of those big lecture halls is part of the experience. Um, so what that means is yes, they are in that huge lecture hall, with hundreds of other students. However, they are required to sit in smaller seminar classes. Those are roughly between you know, 15 to 25 students. And then their upper division courses are going to be much smaller. So roughly about the 20s and 30s, um, sometimes smaller depending on the quarter or their major. Um, again, no more than like the 35s per quarter. Uh, I also wanted to put a little note, all of the UCs except UC Berkeley and UC Merced are on the quarter system. So UC Berkeley and UC Merced are on this semester, um, and then the rest of us are on the quarter system. Uh, UC Davis does have a veterinary school on our campus. Uh, we do have housing for freshmen and transfer students, not required or mandatory to live on our campus. However, strongly recommended. Our students populate about 40 to 45% of the city of Davis. So this year is very different. Our campus and the city of Davis is much more quiet um, because we don't have nearly as many students on our campus. It is a true college town. 
And there's a lot of faculty and staff that live in the city of Davis. So your students, or if you're visiting your students, families, um, you might see faculty and staff in downtown Davis, uh, walking around at the grocery store. Uh, so really great, again, opportunities on our campus. We are the Aggies, we are blue and gold. Um, maybe some of you are alum, go Ags. So we are a bike town also. I think Sebastian might talk about that as well at UC Santa Barbara. So that is our number one mode of transportation. You get across campus a lot quicker that way. Don't worry parents, they don't have to have a bike. Um, students, I would definitely practice riding a bike with your backpack on because your balance does change with that aspect. Um, so if you have any other questions, I will put my email in the chat so you can email me at any time, but talking along the lines of what Violetta mentioned, UC Davis for fall 2021, we are going test free also. So if you report your SAT or um, ACT exams, we will not consider it as part of your review. I know Sebastian mentioned there is a website um, that you can look at to see what each campus is doing, but I think all of us, since we're here, will tell you about it. I know there are questions about you juniors. Juniors, I know you're in here. It is going to be completely test optional for you as well. I know a lot of you might have heard that UC is in litigation right now, so we can't really talk on behalf of that. But as of right now, for our juniors, our fall 2022, it will still be optional. But please, please, please do not stress about studying for the SAT or ACT right now, you juniors. Um, there's a lot on your plate already. You are all more than just a number. Okay, so please know that you are more than just a number on one day also. So don't let a test score think that that's going to dictate um, your admission into the UC because we do read everything in your application. So I'm going to go ahead and pass it along to my colleague. Melanie, and I guess what I wanted to just clarify a statement I said earlier on um, in terms of selection. Um, traditionally, there has been 14 uh, criteria that have been utilized in the admission selection process, um, not 15. <laughs> okay, so 14. All right, so. Going forward with UC Merced, so we are the 10th and newest campus in the UC system, founded just 15 years ago, and our campus was born to increase access to UC eligible applicants who meet our selection factors and to also um, bring economic growth to the Central Valley community. We're located right in the heart of Central Valley, um, San Joaquin Valley, about two and a half hours from the Central Bay Area, Sacramento, and about an hour and a half to, um, from our majestic neighbor to the east, Yosemite National Park. Um, there are a total of 8,000 students, a um, little over 8,847 8, students at UC Merced, making us, of course, the smallest in terms of population of students. It doesn't provide that small, intimate feel similar to a private school, but combined with all the resources that comes with being a large public research institution. It really is the best of both worlds at UC Merced. We do offer 25 superb undergraduate majors that are housed in three schools, our School of Engineering, our School of Social Sciences, Humanities, and the Arts, and our School of Natural Sciences. Um, none of our majors that you see Merced are impacted, which means that we will not be taking into account your major during selection uh, purposes. It also means that you will be getting all the classes that's required of you when it comes to registration. And if you choose to switch majors once you're at UC Merced, it's very easy to do so. Just work with your academic advisors. We offer over 200 clubs and organizations, everything from Greek life, to cultural-based organizations, religious organizations, special interest groups. And it's also very easy to pioneer your own club and new traditional setups for future generations to also enjoy. One thing I also wanna point out is the fact that we have ventured into the top 100 best universities and colleges in the nation this year, uh, according to US News and World Report. And amongst our public institutions, we are in the top 40. That speaks volumes to the quality of education that you're gonna find at UC Merced, being that we are such a young campus. We've also just completed our 2020 expansion project where we doubled the capacity of our campus by adding three new residence halls, new dining facilities, new classroom spaces, as well as a new event center and wellness center and outdoor swimming pool. So our campus is growing and we're gonna to continue to grow for future years ahead of us, eventually making us down the line the, becoming the largest UC campus in terms of land. And then one thing to note about admissions um, at UC Merced, uh, we will be test free for the SAT and the ACT examination. So we will not be utilizing your test scores during our selection process. You may still submit those for consideration in terms of meeting an A through G requirement if need be, um, or even for the UC uh, writing examination if you are admitted to the campus. 
However, in terms of admission purposes, we will not be utilizing your SAT or AC, SAT or ACT scores for fall 21 um, and so on. And with that, I'd like to turn it over next to my colleague, um, Andrews, I believe. Santa Barbara, sorry. <laughs> Thanks, Tim. Um, all right. Yeah, so going off of UCSB, again, just for a quick overview. So we are also, as well, a research-based um, university. So we do have six different Nobel laureates that came out of here. Um, we have been ranked this year as number six public university through US News World Reports. Um, and again, we are an extremely supportive campus. We really want to make sure that students do feel comfortable, that they want to be here rather than feeling forced to be here. Um, so whatever it is that you like to do, either personally or academically, non-academically, you will have an opportunity to do that. Um, within Santa Barbara as well, I think part of our community is that it creates this ranking, which I know sounds weird, but we actually have been ranked as number one happiest university in the state of California through Princeton Review. Um, but again, as you can tell, just for those who have not been to our campus, you can see on the right, um, our campus is literally on the beach. So I'm not exaggerating, that is actually where it is. Um, so again, all students will take advantage of the outdoors, go surfing for the first time, or going to the mountains and going hiking as well. Um, so again, you will have a lot of opportunities to do outdoorsy things as well as indoors. Um, as you heard from Melanie as well, we are also very well known as our bike friendly campus. Um, so yes, you do not need a bicycle either. Um, you can also go with a skateboard or longboard. We actually have specific skateboarding, longboarding lanes on campus. That's how many actually are doing that. If not, all of the buses are free for students. So you're easily able to go all the way to downtown Santa Barbara, all the way to the airport, all the way to the Amtrak train station if you wanted to go through that method. We are about 90 miles north of downtown LA. So again, you are not too far away from all of the big metropolis area. So if you're lacking or you're looking for something additional, we are that close to them. Um, of course, we do also have over 500 organizations. So tons of opportunities for students to get involved. Um, and we're also a division one institution. So in case you're wondering about sports and you like that environment, we are a division one institution as well. Um, again, outside of that, we also have three different colleges, uh, College of Letters and Science, College of Engineering, College of Creative Studies. Um, so we don't have more than that, but we have a total of about 90 different majors to choose from. Again, you can always ask me about potential majors that we may or may not have. Regarding the SAT and ACT, so for our seniors, we are not going to be using the SAT or SAT scores towards our selection process for fall 2021, meaning our seniors. Current seniors, we're just not using the SAT or SAT. For our current juniors, we are test optional at the moment. Um, so again, just something to keep in mind as you look into it. I know there's a lot of questions about that. So hopefully this helps a little bit. Um, and again, as everybody else is doing, I will be adding um, our email specifically for the office of admissions um, on the chat box since there are a lot of people here from different areas. And I wanna make sure I can contact you with the correct counselor. Thanks everyone. Hi everybody, it's Judy again. Um, so I could go on and on and on about UC Santa Cruz, but I'm gonna try and you know keep it in some sort of order. Um, I was a slug myself back in the day. I'm not going to tell you when, but you know, as you can see, I've returned back to UC Santa Cruz to, to work in admissions and recruit more slugs. Um, so UC Santa Cruz population wise, we're the second smallest UC uh, with 17,000 undergraduates. Um, our top majors are computer science, compu uh, computer science game design, which we are actually the first university to, um, to create the computer game design major, um, physics, business management, economics, and marine biology. Um, so like Santa Barbara, Santa Cruz is a coastal town, but our, our campus is not right on the beach. Um, as you can see in this picture here, I chose this one um, to display. We're actually up a little ways in the mountains. So we have one foot in the Redwood Mountains. So we sit on even though we're the second smallest population wise of the UCs, we sit on 2000 acres of land and most of that land is undeveloped. So we're nestled in the redwood forests and meadows and we're trying to keep that land undeveloped. Um, but from campus on clear days like this, this in the picture, you can actually see the entire town of Santa Cruz and the ocean. Um, and if that, haze of fog in the picture there wasn't there. You can actually see Monterey all the way on the other side of the bay as well. Um, so we are the closest UC campus to Silicon Valley, just a 30 minute drive over Highway 17. So many of our students um, do have opportunities to intern at a lot of the uh, high tech companies, even if you're not in a, uh, a STEM major, we have um, 
we've had literature majors that have interned at Google and gotten hired after graduation for, uh, in marketing. So um, there's many opportunities for our students being so close to Silicon Valley. And we're an hour and a half south of San Francisco. Um, about 90% of all of our undergraduates, so students who are coming in and getting their bachelor's degree, they get to do some sort of research um, internships or research opportunities with our professors. And the great thing about that is once you graduate, you're going to be competing um, for jobs with tons of other people who have also just graduated and everybody is going to be holding up their degrees saying, I have a degree from this great school. But going to a UC, if you were, if you're able to um, participate in undergraduate research, what you have that may many other of those um, competitors for the, that same job don't have is hands-on experience. So not only can you say, I have a degree from a world-renowned uh, public education system, but I also have hands-on experience working on this project with this professor doing this and this and this and this. And that is way more, and hands-on experience is way more impressive um, to somebody who is hiring, who's looking to hire you than, than just a, an education. I'm not saying an education is not important, but having that education and having that experience puts you so much higher up um, than the average person. So UC Santa Cruz is also um, ranked in the top 30 of public universities. Uh, we're ranked 15 in global research impact. And um, most recently, our um, film and digital media uh, major was ranked seventh in, in the nation. And we're also ranked um, ninth in, in the physics program uh, globally. So, um, and the UC system in general, but UC Santa Cruz, we have a very, very robust financial aid uh, package. Um, I know our financial aid department, I watch them work so hard to squeeze every single dollar that they can find to give back to our students to help pay for the, the cost of education. And because of that, over 80% of our students receive some sort of financial aid. Even the students who think that they don't qualify for financial aid, we tell them apply for the FAFSA and if we can get you money, we will. Um, so I'm not gonna go on and on and on because then Cynthia won't get to talk about UC San Diego. So I'm gonna pass it on to her. Thank you, Judy. Um, again, everyone, UC San Diego, last but not least, um, my name is Cynthia again. I'm one of the admission officers on our team. I'm also an alumni. Um, so I'm happy to share a little bit about that experience. I'm gonna be talking about what UC San Diego has to offer um, and we will answer questions as we go as well. Um, so we are the most Southern located UC campus, uh, literally a 30 to 40 minute drive from the US Mexican border. So we are as far Southern in California as it gets. Um, we are situated on 1200 acres of land in La Jolla, San Diego, known as America's finest city. Uh, we are a 10 minute shuttle drive from La Jolla Shores, which is our local uh, beach and are generally surrounded by some of California's most beautiful beaches. Um, 1200 acres is a large campus physically, um, but we also have a very large student body. We do have about 30,000 undergraduate students and about eight to 9,000 graduate students. So uh, one of the ways that you know, UC San Diego makes sure that you don't feel like just another student on campus is through our unique seven college system. Um, so you may understand other universities have, for example, School of Business, School of Nursing, School of Education, et cetera. At UC San Diego, we refer to those as our academic departments. But in addition to that, we have seven residential colleges that are completely unaffiliated to your major selection. You can have any major you want, be in any college, any college, any major. We do ask that you rank them in the application from your first choice to your seventh choice. Um, there isn't a specific way that you have to do this. Um, you can rank them based on any factor you want, whether it's their general education patterns, their uh, philosophies, their location, etc. cetera. Um, and I will be providing my contact information in the chat. If you have specific questions about them, reach out to us and we can follow up with you. Um, in addition to our college system, 
Academically, we offer our students over 140 majors, minors, and areas of concentration that fall within one of eight disciplines. It could be anything in arts and humanities, physical, social, biological, or health sciences. It could be an interdisciplinary major, or it could also be under our Jacobs School of Engineering or our Scripps Institute of Oceanography. Um, we have tons of research. UC San Diego is a research powerhouse. Uh, we have all kinds of resources to help our students network with their professors, as well as online um, platforms that really facilitate access to internships and research opportunities, both on campus and in the greater San Diego area. In fact, we have $1.35 billion um, in research funding. So you can get involved with research as early on as your first year. It's a matter of just letting us know and the opportunities are there. When it comes to our student life, uh, we do offer over 600 clubs and organizations that you can select from. They range from social, of course, to spiritual, academic. Um, I truly believe that there's a little bit of something for everyone. Um, but if not, all you need is three peers and you can make your own club on campus. So there's various opportunities to really get engaged and involved in that way. Um, so I know that we're all running a little bit late on time. Um, so I did want to leave some time to answer some of the questions live. Thank you so much. Um, we have received tons of questions and we're trying to get through them. And hopefully we can answer some more um, in just a second. Um, but that's a little bit about UC San Diego. I'm going to share our contact information below and you can reach out to us directly um, if you have any specific questions for our campus. Thank you. Thank you guys so much. So we have about 15 minutes um, to go ahead and answer any questions live that we feel would be beneficial for everybody. I mean, I know my mic was going in and out, so I do apologize for that, you guys. Um, my mic, I hadn't been doing that before, so I do apologize. But I think one of the questions we're getting a lot of is the SAT question. Um, so we just, again, want to reiterate that we are test free for the at least the next couple of years um, as a system, but you do want to double check with each individual campus, especially the ones who are not here today. Um, you know, we are, there's the, the majority of us are here today, um, but a few of us are not. So definitely check with each campus to double check and see if you might benefit from submitting the test score, but just know we are not going to be using the test um, SAT or ACT. Um, we will be happy to take any AP exam, SAT subject exam, IB exam, all of those tests that have always been optional, we'll still accept those and they'll still be optional. So just keep that in mind. And if any of my colleagues wanted to add to that response on SAT, please feel free. Or if you feel there's a question in the chat that you would want to respond to that and um, everybody would benefit from, please feel free to do so. I'll take a minute um, and just ask, because I just was looking at the questions and there's a lot of them about the financial aid and scholarships. So the main thing to keep in mind is that within the UC system, so the merit-based scholarships are basically, and again, for the most part, some UC campuses might be a little bit different, but overall, it's all done through the UC application. I'm not exaggerating. It's as simple as you check marking as many scholarships as you want on that application. Again, this is for merit-based scholarships. We will use your application based on that information. We will see if you're eligible for those scholarships or not. This is for in-state and out-of-state students, including transfer students as well. Again, some campuses may have more merit scholarships than other campuses. That's something that you should check with each UC campus. For needs-based, for needs-based, we do need the FAFSA or the California Dream Act. It's either one or the other. But again, they're both due March 2nd of your senior year. They are critical to help you financially. Um, so please do check with that. Um, something to keep in mind because there's a misconception. FAFSA and the DREAM Act are not part of the UC system. We utilize their information, their application to determine which scholarships you are eligible for. The FAFSA and the DREAM Act, one of them is state funded or state, the other one is federal. So again, it's run through the whole country. So please do check with FAFSA or DREAM Act if you have questions specifically about that. Our financial aid offices at each of our campuses, I'm sure will be more than glad to support you with that process in case you do have questions. Uh, but again, it's a separate application, but we need that information to support you uh, financially. Um, I also saw uh, one question, or at least a couple, about veteran-based uh, scholarships. Again, the UCs are very um, good about supporting veterans as well. So if you do have any questions about that, 
again, recommend talking to each financial aid office. We are all admission based counselors or advisors. Um, so again, we don't have all the specifics and it kind of comes to a case by case scenario. So I always recommend talk to each of the UC campuses for their financial aid offices for that support. Thank you, Sebastian. That was really thorough. I just wanted to add, because I know there was a question that I saw in the chat earlier about how, you know, times are tough right now during COVID and folks have, you know, maybe lost their jobs or, you know, they've, their hours have been reduced. Just know that for financial aid, we do look at the last two tax years. So we will, um, if your family needs to be reassessed due to somebody losing a job in 2020, um, or again, hours being reduced, we will we will allow for students to submit an appeal so that you can um, be, all of that can be accounted for. All right, any other questions that my colleagues have seen that they wanna to respond to? I'll take one question that I saw. It was basically in regards to the total budget for attending a UC campus. And I believe the, it was indicated around 36,000, 38,000. I'm gonna re reiterate once again, when you see those prices, that is just the targeted estimated budget based on the high end. A lot of variables do occur with housing, for example. If you live with three roommates versus one roommate, you're gonna save substantially. Um, buying your books used versus brand new will save you a lot of money. And if you are on your parents' health insurance forms, for example, you can have $2,000, $400 health insurance fees that are typical of each UC campus weight. So do not let the targeted sticker price ever deter you away from applying to the UC. I'd like to encourage you to apply to university, apply for financial aid if that's a factor for you. A lot of times those budgets do not even take into account what you're receiving with financial aid. So do apply to the UCs, do apply for financial aid. If you are admitted, you will then be given your award letter. And at that point, you will see what the total net cost would be for you to attend each respective campus. I'd like to encourage you not to get turned off um, when you see these prices up front from applying to the UC campuses. Any of my other colleagues see a question that they want to take on or stab on? Yeah, um, I actually did want to, I, I saw a lot of questions about um, what research is. And I do want to address that just because I'm so passionate about it. Um, but we, we hear the term, we throw out the term like research, research impact, research statistics, you know, we rank this in the research. But many people actually don't really understand what research is um, specifically. So for example, UC system is a research uh, system, whereas the, they hear that the, the CSU is not. And one of the questions was, you know, well, what, what makes a research system different? So with a research university, the professors, their, you know, their job is to teach our students. So we are an educational system, but as part of a research institution, the professors also have a second job, which are, which is to, um, have a project that they are consistently growing, um, learning new things, new discoveries, adding adding to the educational world. Um, examples is you know in in STEM area of uh, technology, we had a robotics professor who created you know uh, an eyeball, like fake eyeball for somebody who was blind, like you could actually put a machine in your head and see. So you know that's that's amazing. Or in humanities, we have um, a history professor who's collecting um, stories from um, survivors of the Japanese internment camps, because we need to preserve that part of our history. And they're, they're compiling it into an anthology, something that, you know, will add to the knowledge that we have as, as humans. And um, the great thing about these projects is those professors need a team and the team is made up of our undergraduate students and that's what research is when you join that team with that professor you are working towards finding new knowledge and putting it out there and that that is research experience um, so i hope that makes it just a little bit more clear what research opportunities are Hey, um, I saw a question about extracurriculars in the time of COVID, and I think um, maybe we, if anybody else wants to follow up, but I think for Berkeley specifically, you know, we're going to be very flexible. We understand, especially like our, our juniors who, you know, might not have the opportunity to get involved in, you know, 
um, extracurriculars now or our seniors who maybe had to halt certain activities. We totally understand that. Please, um, if you're continuing to do any extracurricular activities virtually, make sure you continue to list those as always. But if you are not able to get involved in certain extracurriculars because of the current COVID situation, we are going to be very understandable about that. Let us know in the additional comments um, kind of what your particular and specific situation might be. Um, additionally, you know, there's all form. There's so many types of extracurricular activities. It's not just your typical clubs and sports. You know, you might be at home with younger brothers and sisters and you're having to help tutor them or you're maybe their teacher um, through virtual learning. And that's a form of, of leadership that we will look at as an extracurricular activity. Or maybe you're supporting your family in other ways. Maybe you have a, a job, especially for our like transfer students, they might have jobs. Um, so there are different types of extracurriculars. It's not just, you know, the clubs and sports, but we're going to be very flexible with that. So just make sure you talk about it in the additional comments so we can kind of understand your situation. And if any of my colleagues want to add anything to that, please feel free to do that. Kind of, I'll go off just a little bit, but more towards keeping the activities side of things. Um, I saw a lot of questions about as well, which activity should I add? Is volunteering better than this one? Should I do sports? Is it award better? So just to put it in short, simple terms for everybody, whatever you end up doing, everything and anything will help your application process. So there is no one activity or event or program that is going to be better than the other. Um, so this could mean you volunteering for 50 hours. This could mean just playing sports. This could mean traveling the world and learning different languages. Um, the list is endless. So don't feel pressure to put one over the other because you think it's going to look better. What I recommend as much as possible, everything you've done, everything you've done outside of studying is going to help your application process. Um, so again, don't feel pressure that there's one over the other. There's no conception or um, kind of uh, specific or um, specific organization or activity that we're looking for in our application. We're looking for everything and anything you have done personally. And to Great. kind of bounce off of a little, sorry. Yeah, go ahead. <laughs> I, I just to bounce off what Sebastian just said, um, we also understand y'all that there is a global pandemic happening right now. So if you were heavily involved in certain clubs or orgs or sports, we completely understand that that might look very differently for you, differently for you right now. Um, so talk about that, you know, let us know, um, you know, you could include a quick little comment in the extracurricular section or additional comment section, or even if you want to expand on your PIQs, but um, know that we understand um, and we're not expecting you to, to be, you know, full force um, playing basketball or, or soccer, whatever it is that you're doing right now because of the pandemic. Um, so there is a lot of fluidity and a lot of flexibility going on right now. And I know I saw a question about the PIQs and kind of, um, what, let me go back to the question really quickly. I think it was about kind of how it's used in the review process, like how big of an influence do PIQs have towards the admission selection process? Does anybody want to respond to this briefly here? We have about four minutes. Any of my colleagues want to take this question? Is it just what we're looking for in the PIQs? Yeah, the question is just like, what's the, what, what, how big of an influence is the PIQ in the admission selection process? Yeah, absolutely. I'll take this on. Um, so I think it, especially now, it's important because that will help us understand each student's circumstance. Um, what we are really looking for is to learn as much as we can about the student as, as a student as a person in their community, as a person in their family, a person in their school, um, so on and so forth. So we really want to learn about them. So students, they're called personal insight questions for a reason. We want insight on who you are. There's additional comments. So you can include anything extra in the additional comments section. So what I would recommend students to try and avoid, I know this is really hard, but try and stop comparing yourself to each other because when we're reading your application, we're really looking at you in your environment. So when I'm reading Judy's application, I'm looking at Judy and her environment. I'm not comparing Judy to Cynthia, to Sebastian. Um, we're really looking at you and your environment. Yes, we know we're in this pandemic, we're in it together, but we're all experiencing it very different. 
hey, we're all in this presentation together, but we're all experiencing it very different. So that's what makes all of us unique. So help us understand it in your personal insight questions. Think of your UC application as your grades, your courses, your activities and awards as like your resume, right? So just basic information, quick information, quick facts. Your personal insight questions is essentially your interview with us. That's where we get to hear your voice. And you're probably wondering, Melanie, how do you hear my voice in the UC application? Trust me, it is a human reading your application at all nine of our campuses. It gets read multiple times. There's no control alt F for finding keywords. If there was, we would have given you all today because that would make our lives easier and yours. However, there's no system like that. There's not even my percentage. There's no calculator that says this, this, this is 5%, 10%, 50%. If there was, again, we'd give it to you. Um, so we really consider everything in your application. So let us hear your voice. We can tell when students are authentic, they're honest in their response, when they're talking about their creative side, when we can hear how passionate they are about this specific subject. Um, whatever it is, we can tell when students are truthful and honest. We can also tell when students are kind of forcing us a response. Maybe they're forcing a leadership example. Um, there's no specific question we want to read. What we want to read is about you and your experiences. So if you want to talk about your creative side, great. If you want to talk about leadership, great. If you want to talk about an educational opportunity, fantastic. Um, but really choose questions that pertain to you because that's all we really want. So I know, again, it's hard to compare yourself from other people, from other students in your school, your friends, whatever it is. But when we are reading it, we're reading you in your environment. Um, so help us understand that because we know these are such trying times. Great. Um, so we're basically here at the end. We have one minute. So if any of my colleagues want to add anything else before we wrap this up, um, please go ahead. Oh, you. There we go. I just quickly want to say that um, for the folks submitting their questions, we do recognize that we weren't able to answer every single question. Um, we see them. Uh, we're just running low on time. So I really do encourage you to jot down our contact information that was provided in the chat and follow up with us. Um, we were more than happy to connect with you. It's just we don't have the enough time right now. Um, so please, please follow up with us and we'd be happy to um, answer all of your questions. Thank you. Yeah, that's a great point. Um, and I did want to thank all of my colleagues who are here um, for, for your time and for your participation. I also wanted to thank, um, we have a few Berkeley students who are trained admissions advisors who are helping us with the chat. Thank you all so much for helping us as well. So um, if no one else has anything else to say, then we can go ahead and end it here. Thank you, everyone. Thank you so much. Thank you, everybody.